Is this where you're supposed to be? Good. Cool. I want to thank some of our sponsors here before we get started on the, this lecture. Of course, St. Mary's University, USAA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, National Security Agency, Exabeam, Accenture Federal Services, Open Security, Titanium Level, CyberSec Jobs, Denim Group, Alamo, ISSA, Landmark Solutions, and others. Uh, for those of you who did not know, there's a raffle down at the registration table. Be sure to get in that and then stay for the after party. Uh, this lecture, Hacker MBA Soft Skills for Hackers, Kasim Ijaz. Take it away. Thank you. All right. It's too late to change your minds. So stuck here now for an hour. Um, Thank you. So this is basically um, things I learned from my MBA, uh, thanks student loans. And uh, you know, just working as a pen tester and trying to put it together in, in a way that pen testers, hackers, you know, cybersecurity professionals can understand it. Trying to take out those boring uh, topics like accounting and just you know, talk about what applies to us. All right. So who am I? Um, I've been asking myself that question a lot, but uh, currently I lead a pen testing group at Coldfire Labs. We do pen testing, risk advisory, and whatnot. Um, I teach adoptive penetration testing course at Black Hat and have performed quite a few penetration tests and uh, HIPAA high trust assessments. So if you are in healthcare field or want to know how awesome it is not, um, you can talk to me. And that's my Twitter handle if you want to, you know, follow my rants. So the agenda today, we are going to talk about teamwork. Uh, we're going to talk about time management and task management ethical decision-making, leadership skills, um, and then we'll get into some communication hacks before we open it up for questions, okay? All right, so size doesn't matter when you work as a team, but what is team? We right now are a team, okay? We're all working towards a goal. That's what team really is. And you don't have to be a team of multiple people. You could be a team of one. You're all teams at home with your family. Your team at work, even if you're working by yourself towards some research project, maybe you're writing a blog post, you could be a team of one at that point. All right, so we are all playing the role of a team, and there are different pieces of projects sometimes that require a team. And here I'm thinking of a project of maybe a penetration test. Maybe your clients hired you to perform a pen test for HIPAA, high trust, or for, I don't know, PCI, or FedRAMP, whatever you are going to require some complementary skills. Maybe you have in that penetration test scope a uh, web app, and you have a network. Maybe you give the web application portion to somebody who is really good at web apps, and then you give the network portion to somebody who's really good at networking. And then you have a project manager or somebody who is playing that mediary role between you and the client. All right. Um, we like to combine the knowledge and expertise in those teams, um, and that's what really makes them excel. So we'll talk some more about teamwork, uh, but of course, there's got to be some memes, right? And teamwork does get uh, SHIT done. It's a school, so I have to be PG-13. So <laughs> there was this research done by J. Richard Hackman. He's a professor of social and organizational psychology at Harvard. And what he came up with were enabling conditions of great teamwork. And there are four conditions to it. Number one you've got is compelling direction. You have to have a direction that you are working towards and it's compelling to you. It energizes and orients you, right? Uh, pen testers, we want to go get that domain admin. Blue teamers, I have to stop that hacker. Right, um, or if you're on a TV, of course, you have to use two keyboards. But not many people got that. All right, uh, <laughs> you got to watch CSI. But uh, a, a good team has to have a compelling direction that they work towards. Okay, and that compelling direction must also reduce confusion. If you've got a hundred directions and everybody is working towards their own goal it is going to cause confusion, and you're going to end up with shadow teams within a team. 
you have to have a strong structure. Um, what I mean by that is uh, there are multiple things in there. You have to have, you must have some defined processes. You can't just wing it all the time, right? What happens when one of your employees leaves? Is it a process for that? Uh, you just hired somebody. Is there a process on how you put them on a client project? Or do you just throw them in and then find out uh, they're totally screwed it afterwards? Or do you create a process that is you know, understood by you, that is a result of your work over the years? And the team follows that. And team can contribute to that process. It doesn't have to come from top down. It could go from bottom up. It has to often go from bottom up because it's people that are working in the field that understand how things are done and then they come with those processes. And diversity I talk about here doesn't have to be, and it really isn't diversity of, you know, you got to hire somebody from outside the country or you got to hire somebody of different skin color. It, it means diversity of skill set, diversity of experiences. The different experiences you have, different skill sets you have, it together reduces the group think. And the group think is everybody just thinks or assumes that we're going towards that one direction while they might be working elsewhere. Or group think is where, uh, for example, um, some of the things I've seen is client thought everything was fine, right? They were like, yeah, we got two-factor authentication. Nobody can get in. Well, they're missing two-factor authentication in some areas, but they don't have anybody with the skill set to understand that. All right, so you've got compelling direction, you've got strong structure. You also need supportive context. Without context, it's just a bunch of processes, just a bunch of paper, or, you know, words that are said that don't mean anything, okay? So in the supportive context, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to give people raises. I mean, that always helps. It's good. We all love raises and bonuses. But there's other forms of support you can provide. For example, IT, right? Uh, at, at my job, we have a separate IT department dedicated to pen testers. So they provide us that support. So we don't have to worry about those things. Um, or some other kind of rewards program. For example, if you're training people internally, maybe have some kind of badges. You get a green badge once you finish our onboarding. You get a yellow badge once you watch this other video that we have as part of our you know, advanced onboarding program. Or you get a blue badge, and I'm just throwing out colors out there. Uh, <laughs> you get a blue badge when you're training somebody. These types of rewards help people. And one of the talks I was at Burkhan yesterday talked about having one of those WWE, uh, WWE belts, those wrestling belts. They had those, and they just set some, you know, uh, geeky things on them, or they just set some rewards programs and binary and things like that. And that's what they gave out to people when they did something cool. Shared direction is very important. So you're working towards a goal, but where does that goal take you? I know we all say journey is what's more important than the direction, uh, but fostering that common identity and Having that common understanding of where we are going is very important. Um, for example, if you know that the company is going to hire 40 more people, you know you're going towards the direction of a bigger company. And if your folks don't know that, that is going to be a very challenging. All of us are going to start seeing more people coming in. So that com communication is important, and that comes into this supportive context and uh, direction. So you've got four things in here, right? You've got compelling direction. You have strong structure. You have supportive context. And you are sharing a direction. All right? Yay, teamwork. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is how do you have a shared mindset? That's what I find a lot of people struggle with is, yeah, we've got a team, everybody wants to hack, but a lot that could mean a lot of things. Maybe somebody does not want to do application tests at all, and that's all we're getting. Maybe somebody does not want to do red teams, but they're being pushed into it. So ensure that everybody in your group, regardless of where they are, feel empowered. What that means is if you are, let's say, a multi-regional company, 
Uh, we at Coldfire have our headquarters are in Colorado. I run the Atlanta team. We have Denver team, uh, Westminster team. We've got California, and I'm going to stop bragging. Um, but all those offices, if they don't feel empowered, it's going to start making people feel like everything only happens at headquarters. We can't do anything, right? And that affects the team. Or even if you're all remote, uh, maybe send your remote workers some something nice. Maybe send them a shirt that has company's logo on it. Maybe say something um, cool like, you know, um, I work from home or whatever we came up with. Um, or send them um, blankets. <laughs> just, just come up with something cheesy, something good that makes them feel empowered. And same thing goes not just by region, but also goes by skill set. Okay. If you've got some folks who have been doing a certain type of project for a long time, maybe they've only been in blue team and they want to move into red team or the other way around, work with them, help them feel empowered and feeling that they can do that. Lateral movement within organizations is very important because it not only helps schemes, helps create that teamwork, but also, you know, gives you retention and gives you strong skill set. If somebody was a blue teamer and now they moved into a red team, they're a very strong red teamer because they understand both sides now. You want to create shared experiences for people. And that could mean maybe you all go to B-Side San Antonio together. Uh, maybe you go to Black Hat DEF CON or you go to an escape room. Um, one thing that I found really works very well with my team, and I've been trying to schedule it again, um, is axe throwing. <laughs> you know, they have these places you can go and throw some axes or uh, those smash bars. We can smash things. Whatever works for you. Maybe you just get together and you just do a hackathon. Maybe you go grab some beers. Whatever works for your team. You just have to have, you just want to have those shared experiences to talk about, to feel like you are a part of a team. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite things is uh, structured, unstructured time. That could be maybe one Friday a month, you get together and you just talk about something stupid. Or you just talk about something that has nothing to do with work. Uh, maybe you want to talk about your uh, family life. Maybe you want to talk about the game. Maybe you want to um, talk about some new hack that you saw. Maybe you want to go watch a movie together. That structured, unstructured time, while some might still feel they're at work, it, it, it brings in their inner self and makes you more of uh, a family. All right. I hate. I'll, I kind of hate using the word family for for work because you gotta have that you know family and work time separate. But the the more close you feel, the closer you feel as a team the better you will perform. So structured, unstructured time, go watch a movie once a month. It doesn't cost much. Okay, You, you might even find that your teammates want to pay it out of their pocket. Uh, preferred method usually would be that your company pays for it. Um, or just create some stupid stickers. I've got some. Get some afterwards. All right. But for this structured, unstructured time, be sure nothing else gets scheduled at that time. Okay, uh, we usually have a calendar block for that on our calendar, so nobody in a different time zone or a different office ends up scheduling a call at that time, because that is going to have a negative impact, of course. All right, so you, you all know Night King understands the importance of teamwork, and if you don't watch Game of Thrones, don't tell me. It's okay. It's okay. All right, so we just finished teamwork. Um, and next, we're going to talk about time management through task management. Okay, The idea really is don't try to manage time. Manage your tasks. Okay, Because then you can accomplish more in a short amount of time. And what I love about task management is when you can check off those tasks at the end of the day, it makes you feel like you just accomplished something. Right, um, and it's of course going to help you with multitasking because you can take multiple tasks and you can break them down 
into smaller tasks. Because whenever you are multitasking, you really are not, we don't really multitask. It's not like you are that hacker in CSI, I know I'm giving that reference again, with two keyboards. You can't do that. You only have that one keyboard you're working with. Um, so what you're really doing is you spend 30 seconds in the, on this email, and then you spend 20 seconds on the text, you come back and spend 30 seconds on the email. So with task management, you can actually keep track of those things, and you'll realize that you're doing it better. Okay? Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> and Miss Wilkins is right. <laughs> so instead of fitting your work into eight hours, if you still work eight hours or 10 hours or whatnot, um, think about what are the tasks that I have to accomplish today? And can they fit in the time I have? What that's going to help you with is saying no. Learn to say no to people, even if it's your boss. The sooner you learn to say no, the better you'll have your work-life balance, and the better you'll be able to manage your time and do your work. Okay, And it's always the hardest thing to learn to say no to somebody superior than you, you know, your boss or VP of the company or somebody who's been at the company for a long time. But it's important for the other side to also understand that when somebody's saying no to me, they're not really saying, I don't want to do this for you. They're telling me why. So tell them why, why you are saying no. My favorite thing is, hey, I would love to do this for you, but I won't be able to do it well if I do it now. So how about I come back to you? Or how about we find somebody else? Joe is pretty good at it. Maybe he can do it, right? Give them an option. That way you are doing that quote unquote consultant speak. You're not really, you know, straight up saying no, but you're actually saying no. Um, it is a tangible thing, the task management, especially if you are using sticky notes. Anybody still use sticky notes? I still do sometimes, yeah. And you can just take that and burn that and keep a lighter in your office. Just just take off the uh, smoke sensor and just, you know, <laughs> burn those. <laughs> um, I'm on the video saying that. Awesome. Um, <laughs> But, but you have finite time in your day to do things. A and you can't just take on everything. I know sometimes we love taking on more work because something new came up that's really cool and we want to do it. Well, then you have to balance it. You have to start with, here are the things that I have to get done. They're important. And here are the things I want to learn. And they're all coming towards me. I have to balance. Find that balance and make sure you don't work too hard. All right, and uh, I'm not gonna say all that, you know, the, 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 you only have so much time in your life and whatnot, but the reality is the more work you do, less productive you will be. And the less productive you are, the less you are going to learn, the less you'll be able to perform, and the more you will hurt the team's goal or the company. All right, so in, in the end, all of that is going to factor into your own career. So learn to say no. So how do you multitask like a pro? Um, always look at the big picture. Look at, look ahead. So if you've got a project coming up, let's say you are doing a security assessment, okay? You are starting with meeting with the client, understanding their scope, understanding their objectives, and you're going to go all the way at the end towards giving them that report. Well, write those steps down and put some timelines on them and start thinking what are the tasks I'm going to have to perform in that time. When I give the client the report, what are the smaller tasks I will have to perform? For example, in that report you'll have to perform QA, you have to fix things that come back from QA, then you have to provide the client the report, you have to email the client about the report. There are many small tasks that you could break it down to. And then you want to sequence those tasks in a, in a strategic way, okay? Uh, here are the tasks that must be done sooner because something else depends on them. I can't start my pen test unless I have a scope. So the scope comes first, all right? Um, I cannot provide the client a report unless the pen test is complete or unless the um, team has provided all their findings. So you want to strategize, you want to prioritize those tasks. And next point is very important, protect yourself. 
whenever you are agreeing to things, my preferred way is through email. Because then there is this written chain um, that talks about, I agree to do this this time, right? I'll, okay, I'll get it done next week. Well, now your boss can come to you tomorrow and say, hey, you haven't gotten it done yet. Well, you can refer them back to that email. And, and bosses are not always going to be malicious about it. It's just sometimes we forget. We're all humans. Or if you forget, you'll have that email in there that you might look at. One of the things I like to do with my emails is I don't mark it red unless I've done what was asked of me in that email. That ends up becoming your task management tool right there. Okay. Um, I've started seeing a lot of people do this where they set up an auto reply or out of office for any time they have to really dedicate to a project. If you're on client site, for example, set up an out of office so folks don't keep hammering you with an email and expect you to respond. You could always have a reply in there saying, hey, if you need me urgently, call me. And uh, folks are usually, and I say usually, except when they're spammers, less likely to call if it's not urgent. Okay, so have something like that in place. So we're talking about the task management. There are a few tools that I've tried, and I want to talk about them. You've got your uh, list-based to-do list. Right? Uh, some of you may have used Wonderlist, Todoist, or Toodledo. They're pretty good for organizing your tasks, maybe by a priority, maybe by date. You have the list of things that you can go through. I've seen a lot of people do that in OneNote. I've seen folks do that in sticky notes on their whiteboard. Whatever works for you. Um, one of the things I like to do in my Trudeldo, I, I, I use Trudeldo and I use uh, Todoist because um, I'm crazy. Only use one. But uh, in Trudeldo, one of the things I like to do is provide context. So if I'm creating a task, I'm going to find a task that has to be done before the second task can occur, and I create a subtask instead. So you don't have a separate task. You know you got to finish these subtasks before you finish the one on the top. It creates that hierarchy, creates that structure, and structure helps us, um, especially when you're in the security field. We are in the security field because we love structure. Okay, uh, we don't find it unfortunately, but it, it it helps, and especially in task management, it's very useful. Second thing I'm seeing a lot of people use is Kanban, like Trello does that. It's pretty cool. Um, or if you could just do sticky notes again. Um, the three fields I like to have in that, the uh, three uh, decks of cards are in progress, to do, and done. Okay. There's an additional one I'll talk about in a minute that's pretty useful, but these are the three ones, to do, in progress, and done. Uh, I'm not a big fan of these uh, lately because a lot of my tasks now have a required date. So if you've got a date, uh, something like Kanban can be a little difficult. Uh, but in the end, whatever works for you. And if you love command line, um, there is Task Warrior that's pretty useful. I also see people use Vim or Nano. Um, you don't have to prove anything. Just, just, just use sticky notes. Whatever works for you, though. But in the end, use what is best for you. Everybody has different styles. So you don't have to stick with one style. You don't have to stick with one tool. I tried a lot of tools before I stuck with one or two that I like. Okay. Um, if you like Evernote, stick with Evernote. If you find that having a notebook with you all the time works better, go with that. Everyone learns and does things differently. So just be mindful of that. One thing, though, you have to be mindful of when you're using these tools is don't put any confidential or any proprietary information in there. We're all security folks. We know these things have data breaches. The Trello boards often ha are public, and you can see what people are talking about. Uh, you can see their cake recipes. So um, just be mindful of that. All right. Um, one thing I wanted to... Uh, finish it with was delegation and not to do list. When you are given a task, think about if if you have to do it yourself, okay. And if you don't have to do it yourself, delegate. Find somebody who is really good at it, 
or wants to learn it and give them that task. It has two benefits. Number one, you just free up some, some time for yourself. And number two, you train somebody in your organization to take some of those tasks in the future. Maybe replace you one day when you move up. Okay? Uh, and they don't have to be this side. They could be this side too. Um, if, and if you don't have to do this task at all, maybe not today, we don't have to do it this year, create a not-to-do list or do later list and add it there. These could be your future ideas of things you want to do. You want to start a company. You want to get your master's. You want to get your CISP. Add tasks like that to that list. And do review that list periodically. Don't just forget about it. Uh, but have, if you're using Kanban or whatever, have that list of things that you will do sometime in the future. Okay. Keeps track of your goals. All right. And end of the day, uh, when you check off those done today lists, that's going to feel very liberating. Um, and then you can do all the things tomorrow. Okay. Uh, whenever we talk about time management, task management, teamwork, oftentimes you got to think about procrastination. Okay. And what I've learned is it, it, it's not really a, um, and this actually comes from this book, Solving the Procrastination Puzzle. Procrastination is not a logical thing. It's an emotional response to what's called seven triggers. Okay, And those seven triggers are maybe the task is boring or frustrating. You've been telling your boss you don't want to do this uh, penetration test or you don't want to, um, you know, um, do this load balancing for this uh, software or whatever else. So you've been telling your boss you don't want to do it and it keeps coming back to you. It's going to get frustrating and it's going to be something that just goes to the back of the pile. Okay, Maybe the task is too difficult for you. You need to break it down or you need help. Maybe it is too ambiguous. We all know those tasks that are very ambiguous. Yeah, can you do this report tomorrow? Okay, and what is it about? You know, give me specifics. Maybe it's very unstructured task. Except those Friday movies. Those are good. Um, maybe the task isn't rewarding. Okay. We, while not everything has to be rewarding in financial sense or you don't have to get stickers for everything, if you don't feel any kind of reward for something, we don't feel that we accomplished that day. All right. Even if it means just getting a thanks. Just getting a thank you from your boss or, you know, good job there. Or your teammates acknowledging that. Um, and number seven is lacking in personal meaning. Maybe you just got the job because you needed a job and now you just don't like it because it wasn't something you wanted to do with your life. It's lacking in that personal meaning and that is why you're procrastinating. Um, if you have to do the task, uh, one of the things I would just say is just do something. Just do one thing in that task. If you're writing a book, and even if you just write down a title, there's something you've done. Next day, come back and just look at the title and see what could be the first line. Just, just one thing at a time could eventually turn into something. Okay. So anything that can get you started. Of course, I had to put that in there. Anybody, anybody ever watched Chuck? Yeah, I'm glad somebody admits. <laughs> All right. So, whenever you are working in security field, all of us usually are, uh, th there come some decisions that aren't necessarily right versus right uh, wrong. They are just like l questions of legal. It becomes an issue of ethics, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay. Any questions so far, though? Should have asked. I'm awake. All right. So let's talk about ethical decision making and ethical hackers. Um, so I, I talk about ethical hacking in here because whenever you think about ethics and security, that's one of the things that comes up. But it doesn't necessarily have to apply to that. Uh, but think about it. If you are a penetration tester 
and uh, you were performing a pen test against a client, but one of your associates, one of your juniors, ended up running a vulnerability scan against everything, including things that were not in scope. Or you were, anybody ever used Wi-Fi for hacking, wireless hacking? So it's a tool that automates wireless hacking for you, finds WP or WPA networks, and then gives you an option. Do you want to attack network one, two, three, or do you want to attack everything? I once had uh, an associate just attack everything. So now they were attacking not just the client, but their neighbors and Starbucks and whatnot. And, and that's where you have to start thinking about what are the ethical implications of these things. Uh, or if you were looking at uh, some traffic in your network, your blue teamer, and you start seeing uh, somebody's plain text emails, accidentally, or start seeing some patient data, what are the ethical implications? What what do I have to do at this point? Okay, because right versus wrong is easy. You can do right versus wrong decision using the scientific model of decision making, which generally is you know you define the problem. You formulate a hypothesis, you gather the facts, you analyze them, and then you have a theory, a solution. For example, if a teammate in your pen testing form is stealing data and selling it, okay, they got patient records to stole and just selling it in the black market. Um, or if somebody in your IT department is reading people's emails, those are easy decisions to make. However, what if you have to think about things like truth versus loyalty? Do I want to speak truth about this issue I have or do I want to stay loyal to my boss or to my beliefs? Those are your right versus wrong decisions. Right, I'm sorry, right versus right decisions. So one of the case studies we did in my MBA program talked about these uh, from, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, I already know it, uh, Professor Joseph Badaraco. Uh, he's from uh, Harvard. And he put forth this right versus right decision-making framework. He gave four questions to that. First, is this decision I'm going to make good for most people and hurts the least people, right? The utilitarianism. We hear about that all the time. Um, decision we made, yeah, it hurts Joe, but it helps the company. And then once you've decided that, you take that decision, you think about the rights of the humans, the rights of the shareholders. Now that I've made this decision, maybe I'm going to fire Joe. Maybe I'm going, and I'm picking on Joe. Sorry, Joe, if there's a Joe in here. Uh, but is this decision going to hurt that person? Is this going to infringe on their rights as a human? And then, can I live with this decision? Think about what if this decision was printed in the newspaper next day and for us millennials on Facebook next day, right? How would I feel about it? And the last thing is, if all of those you've gone through is, is this feasible in this world as is? So when you're making the ethical decision, you might have to think about, can I just stay the course? That might be ethical at some time. And of course, all of these come after, is it legal? Okay, the laws of the land change often. So you, you have to think about them too. So involve your legal department, involve your you know, um, folks that know law. But these are the four things that you can talk about when you're thinking about ethical decision making, right? It involves your shareholders, it involves the rights of humans, but also involves um, not being able to live with something that you didn't make a decision of. Okay, so you have to think. So for example, if somebody had, um, if, if somebody got a job as an assistant in a company back in the day, let's say 20 years ago, and on their resume they lied and they said they have MBA. And after 20 years they've made vice president of a company. And the requirement in the company for vice president is they have to have an MBA. This person lied about it 20 years ago. Uh, they weren't even applying for an MBA at that time. I mean, for uh, uh, vice president at the time. But they've worked hard all these 20 years, and they've made it to VP, and now they might get fired because they lied about it 20 years ago. So decision like this is where you'll have to think about 
what's the best course of action where I'm not hurting the most people. I am holding on to the human rights and the rights of my shareholders also, because of course business is about shareholders. And I'm able to live with the decision I'm going to make and it is going to stay with the world as is. It's not going to modify the world too much or my company, for example, too much, right? So somebody like that, you might think about maybe you give them um, six months to start en enrolling in MBA. Maybe you only had two classes left. Go and finish them, okay? Uh, maybe if, if, if it comes to that, maybe you fire them, but you have good reason for that. You have to be able to live with that decision and be able to see it in the newspaper the next day and feel proud. That would be an ethical decision. Okay. So the last thing, leadership, and this is a book that I read, and it's a really good book, Extreme Leadership by uh, Jocko Willick and Leif Babin. They have another one that came out recently called Dichotomy of Leadership. And they talk about these leadership lessons they learned as Navy SEALs. And some of them apply to our world quite a bit. Some were way too extreme and I kept them out. Um, but one of the things I love about that book they talk about is everyone is a leader. Everyone is. You're a leader at home. You're a leader at your job. You are doing that task yourself. You are a leader of that task. Maybe you are training someone, even though your title doesn't say senior, but you are leading them. Okay. Maybe you are a mentor to someone. Uh, or you are writing a research. Maybe you're writing a blog. You're leading that team. And they also talk about how there are no bad teams. So if you see a bad team, you need to think about how they're being led. Okay. They use the word, they use the sentence, there are bad leaders. I don't think there are bad leaders. I believe there may be bad leadership principles or methodologies that are at play. Okay. Um, so they, they talk about in their book about these two uh, training groups. Um, they were doing these Navy SEALs exercises in the boats, and one group was always doing really bad while the other was doing really good. They swapped the leaders, and that made both of those teams start competing, you know, neck to neck. And the reason for that was one of the leaders was always yelling at his guys. And what they noticed is the, the, the team was, the team always felt they're going to lose because that's what the leader is telling them. He's constantly saying, we're going to lose. You guys are so terrible. We're going to lose. Well, they're like, okay, <laughs> if that's the case, we're going to keep course. Um, good leaders will always lead by example. Instead of saying, you got to go do this, go with, let me show you how to do this or let's do this. Okay, even if you are not personally involved in the pro in the project or in that task, helping the the folks working on that task feel like they are part of your team, that they are also the leaders of it, helps them perform better. And always, you know, inspire and don't require. Uh, don't be Bill Lumbug. Anybody know? Of, everybody ever watched Office Space? Oh, man, are y'all too young for that? <laughs> All right. I came to U.S. in 2006, and I watched it. <laughs> All right. Um, so in the extreme ownership, always, whenever you are making a decision, tell your team why. I've seen a lot of teams fail because they don't understand why they're doing this task. So explain why you are implementing this new policy. Explain to them why there are these changes being made. Explain why you're hiring more people or... Hopefully you not have to, but why you're fighting people. Make them feel part of that decision-making process. And keep that information sharing, not just top-down, but also bottom-up. Okay, Talk to your team. Get their feedback on decisions. You don't have to do exactly as your team says, but talking to the team and understanding what their concerns are and incorporating their skill set, their experiences into your decision are going to make you a better decision-maker and will make you a better leader. Of course, prioritize and execute. Uh, we talked about that in your task management, but prioritize your tasks and prioritize your decisions and help your team understand why. That will train them to be leaders one day. 
Okay. If if you tell your if you um, explain to your team why this task has to be done before the second task occurs, you won't have to repeat that next time the same project occurs or you have a similar project. And of course, keep it simple. Don't make things complex. Complexity actually is what kills the teams because if there are too many things happening at the same time, if, if you are, you have gone way too deep into management of the project or of the task and you've got so many tasks at this point, folks are going to have a hard time keeping track of that. Not everybody in your team is going to be good at task management. Not everybody in your team is going to keep notes. So the simpler the decision, simpler the mission, the better your team will perform. Okay. And of course, one does not need a title to lead leaders. Everybody is a leader. Uh, if somebody tells you they are, um, that you are not a leader, they are not a leader. <laughs> All right. So leader, leadership is not an ego thing. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks get stuck into an egotistic, I'm a leader and I must be the only leader. It doesn't work very well. All right. So quickly, two things when it comes to communication uh, for your email. Try not to use don't. Say do not. Uh, I know it's a simple, you know, college English composition thing, but it makes you look more professional. And as you're being professional in your email, don't be over formal. Keep it semi-formal. Um, don't add too much verbosity. Don't do dash VVV um, if you're in some command line. But in the email, don't be too verbose. Don't write an essay. If you have to talk about something in detail, use bullet lists. And remember that email is an FYI thing. If you need someone to do something right away, call them. Um, if you email someone, they might not even be checking their emails because they're busy doing something else. So if you need someone to do something right away, give them a call. But if you want them to read that email that day or within a day or two, make sure your subject says something about it. Maybe just put something like important. But don't overuse that. If every email is important email, there are no important emails. All right. Conference calls, attend them. I I often find, especially I'm not sure if it were, if it's the same in all security fields, but pen testers don't like being on conference calls. But when you are talking, when you have a conference call scheduled with a client or with your teams internally, maybe with your HR department or with your finance department, you're telling them about vulnerabilities found in their systems. If you, as the pen tester or vulnerability manager or security analyst, does not join the call, there is no subject matter expert there now. So the call is useless. And don't forget the mute button. Um, we've all been there. <laughs> I once said that's what she said on a call without realizing. So um, <laughs> use that mute button. It's very helpful. It doesn't take long to unmute yourself when you need to. And everybody in the call has a leader. While I love saying everyone is a leader, um, the person who scheduled the call or is, you know, quote unquote, the, the holder of the agenda should play a good mediary role where they make sure one person doesn't take up all the time. There's always somebody in the call who loves to talk, who wants to make sure everybody knows what they are talking about. Well, you have 30 minutes, you have 25 minutes, you have to make sure everybody gets the time to speak. And um, one of the hacks I've seen work very well with calls is don't schedule a 30 minute call, schedule a 25 minute call. Don't schedule an hour call, schedule a 50, 45 minute call. Because if all the calls are 30 minute calls all day long, you're gonna be late to at least one or two of those calls. So leave that five minutes between each call. Maybe the person needs to take down some notes. Maybe they need to compile their notes. Maybe they need to get ready for that call next. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening to uh, to me talk for a whole hour. Um, any questions about anything I've talked about? Awesome. Well, I'll be around if you all have any questions. I've got a bunch of stickers here if you want them um, because uh, I've already filled up my space on the laptop. But uh, thanks, everyone.